Now, starting today, we're beginning an exciting eight-week, brand-new eight-week series called Genesis, Jacob's Journey, where we'll unpack the life of Jacob from chapters 25 to 35 of the book of Genesis. And what we do, just because time is so limited in this 40 minutes that we have to unpack just a few verses and passages for you, what we have done is during the midweek, in the middle of the week, we will also release relevant content, background information, maps, whatever it might be, that will complement this series, the sermon series on Sunday, all right? So how do you get your hands onto those and how do you do those reading up and learning? If you're interested, you go onto our social media, follow us on Instagram or Facebook, or you can head on to fcc.live to the sermon notes today. They're on there in the sermon notes, all right? And here's why we're going on this series. Now, all throughout the year, we've been talking and thinking about taking our own next steps in our discipleship journey. And in this series, what we wanna do is to explore in the Bible, the spiritual journey of one man, one particular biblical character, and how he journeyed from being Jacob, which means deceiver, to being renamed Israel, which means the one who wrestles with God. And the incredible story of Jacob is all about a guy who doesn't trust that God is in control. So he spends his whole life trying to control his own fate and while hurting everyone else around him in the process. And instead of believing God to work it, it, work it all out, Jacob steals, he schemes, he swindles his way to what he thinks is a good life. But as we go through Jacob's journey of ups and downs, we'll begin to see some very important and life-defining truths. And that is that our God is faithful even when we fail Him. And that is our God is gracious even when we don't deserve it. And that is our God is working even when we don't see it. Someone say amen. And this is true in Jacob's life. And you know what? This is still true for us today because our God doesn't change. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we commit the preaching of the word into your hands. We ask that you open up our spiritual ears to hear your voice more than just the words that are in scripture. But we wanna hear your heart for us to encourage us, to comfort us, to challenge us, and even to confront us where we need it most. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Now the title of today's message is called When Trusting God's Promise is a Struggle. When Trusting God's Promise is a Struggle. In today's passage, we'll see three struggles that the biblical characters faced. There are three of them that we'll pick out. And these are the same struggles that we often face when it comes to trusting God's promises in our own lives. What do I mean by that? You'll see very soon. The first struggle that we see in the story is the struggle of waiting. The struggle of waiting. In verse nine, Genesis chapter 25, verse 19 to 21, it goes like this. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Aram, and the sister of Laban, of Aram, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. And the Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. Now the opening lines positions this story in a larger story that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. Now if you're reading the Bible the next couple of weeks, I encourage you to start from Genesis chapter 12. Read Genesis chapter 12 all the way to 35 and track with us the story, this incredible story that started from Abraham and, and all the way to Jacob and his children. So specifically, God promises Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, and his father, Isaac, that God will give them children, so many children that will eventually outnumber the stars in the skies and the sands on the shore. And now, in this passage, there was a major, major problem. And the problem is this. Isaac's wife, Rebecca, had a fertility issue. She couldn't conceive. 
She was simply unable to have children. How is God's promises gonna come through? How are they gonna have children? As many as the stars in the sky if Rebecca cannot even have children. And that looked like it was certainly the end of the story. But Isaac wouldn't have any of it. Look at what he did. He prayed patiently for 20 years. The Bible says he started praying when he was 40 years old. And finally, he had his first child, his first children, when he was 60. Verse 26, later on, it goes, it goes like this. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to the children. Church, the first thing I want you to notice is this. You see, God made Isaac promises, but God also made Isaac wait. Here's one thing we begin to see about God, that God's delays are not God's denials. That what God promises, He will deliver. But sometimes He makes us wait. And how we wait shows who we really trust. I say that again, how we wait shows who we really trust. Interestingly, both Isaac and his father Abraham received the same promise from God. Interestingly, both Isaac and Abraham were both made to wait for the promise, but how they waited was completely different, and it showed and it revealed who they really trusted. In Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 to 2, Here's what it said about Abraham, Isaac's father. Now, Sarai, who is Isaac's mom, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She couldn't conceive too. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, you know what? The Lord has kept me from having children. Why don't you do this? Go and sleep with my slave, and perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. Basically, they took things into their own hands instead of trusting God's promise. Abraham grew impatient, but what we see is Isaac grew impatient. Abraham did it his own way, but Isaac waited God's way. Abraham trusted his own plans, but Isaac trusted God in prayer. Now, if you are in a season of waiting, let me ask you this. How are you doing in your waiting? Or more importantly, let me ask this question. How does the way that you're waiting right now show who you're really trusting in your life? How are you waiting? Are you waiting anxious? Are you waiting frustrated? Are you beginning to stop waiting and say, I'm, going to just, I'm just gonna take things into my own hands. God is not gonna come through for me. I'm gonna to have to do it my way. How are you waiting and who are you trusting? Let your season of waiting become a season of trusting. Turn this season of delay into a season of prayer. But then we have another question, but, but Pastor Dan, what if I am too discouraged to pray? What if I'm too disheartened to keep praying? It's been so long, I'm so tired. I don't know if God is gonna come through for me. Look at verse 21. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. Notice, Rebecca was childless, but it was Isaac that prayed. And knowing how painful it can be for ladies who are trying to have babies are just not, but just not being able to have any babies, I think perhaps Rebecca was too disheartened to pray. I think she was too discouraged to pray after so many years. Have you ever been too discouraged to go on? Have you ever been too disheartened to come even to God in prayer? Maybe some of us are in that season right now. But you know what, we all have moments like these. But what do we do in times like these? What did Isaac do? He prayed on behalf of Rebecca. You see, brothers and sisters, when we can't pray, we can count on other people to pray for us. That's what it means, because we all have times where we can't pray, and we need other people to pray for us. That's why we need community. That's why we need connect groups. That's why we need to be connected into the body of Christ, so that when we are too weak to pray, someone else can pray for us. 
That's what it means. See, Isaac made prayers over 20 years on behalf of Rebekah. The Hebrew word for prayer here, atah, are prayers made to God for others, not for ourselves. It's what we also call intercessory prayers. That's the word that is being used to describe what Isaac is doing here. So if you're feeling strong today, today, pray for other people. But if you're feeling weak today, then ask other people to pray for you. Ask someone next to you to pray for you. Ask someone in your connect group to pray for you. Open up your heart and open up your life and say, I just need prayer today. That's what it means for us when we're too discouraged to pray. And as we'll discover later on throughout this series, Jacob's life was an amazing journey. But the Bible also indicates in no uncertain terms that Jacob's journey of a thousand miles began with one simple but significant step. And that is his dad, Isaac, prayed for him for 20 years. You know, Isaac's patient prayer reminds me of a godly Christian woman called Monica. Monica's son grew up rejecting God. She was a godly woman, but the son rejected God. He was drawn to many other things, like the sciences, the philosophy. He was also drawn to sex. He was drawn to secular ambitions. Basically, everything except his mother's faith. His open rebellion against God deeply saddened his mom, Monica. But instead of giving up on her son, Monica turned to prayer. Monica prayed for him day and night. Her perseverance sometimes looks like this, fasting for a season. It looks like prayer for hours. And sometimes it also looks like following him on his different trips to different countries. Soccer alert. That's what she did. She followed him everywhere. And once she even sought the advice from a church leader. And here's what he said to her. The child of those tears shall never perish. Basically, your child whom you're crying for will not die. Don't worry. To Monica, this was a promise from God. And so she continued waiting and praying. And after 17 long years of patient prayers, Monica's son had a powerful and sudden encounter with the living God. He heard a voice talk to him and tell him to take up and read. He's talking about the Bible here. Take up the Bible and read. And so he ran back home. He opened up his Bible, and in reading the Bible, he discovered the faith that his mom had prayed for him all along. Monica waited upon God's promise, praying for her son for 17 long years, and it made all the difference in his life. Her son, aka better known as Saint Augustine, went on to become one of Christianity's greatest influences, influencing even the spiritual giants, the likes of John Calvin. John Wesley, Martin Luther, and even C.S. Lewis. This is the story of St. Augustine. And it all began with Monica, his mom, patiently praying for him. So brothers and sisters, what is my point? Pray for others. Pray for ourselves. Pray regularly. Pray often. There is power in persevering prayer. Not because of how faithful we are, but because of how faithful God is. Amen. So if you're struggling with waiting, come to the Lord. Come again in prayer. And if you need someone else to pray for you, so be it. Someone else in this house would love to pray for you. I can guarantee you that. Number one, the struggle of waiting. Number two, we see the struggle of worrying. In verse 22, it goes on to say this. The babies jostle each other within her. And she said, this is Rebecca, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Now the Hebrew word rasas here for jostle literally means to violently collide, to crush each other. Listen, this does not describe a shoving match in the playground. This sounds more like a death match in a steel cage. You know what I'm saying? This is a massive fight. Now, from the very beginning, the Bible is already telling us the relationship between these two brothers. It is a matter of life and death. <laughs> Literally, you'll read on in the, in, in the chapters to come. This was during the time, now, this was during the time where dying from childbirth was prevalent. 
It was very normal, very common, very much expected that a mom during childbirth or pregnancy could die. And later on, we would read, spoiler alert, that Jacob's wife, Rachel, did die from childbirth. So what's happening here? Rebecca was worried about what was happening. Am I gonna die, God? Why is this happening to me? And so she went to inquire of the Lord. Now notice this, whenever the Bible says, so and so went to inquire of the Lord, it usually means that they inquired, they sought the Lord through a mediator, through another person. In the times of the kings, it was the prophets. And in the times of the patriarchs, which is during this time, is Abraham, Isaac, and later on, Jacob. They go to their husbands, the wives. So the Bible doesn't record for us who exactly Rebecca's mediator was, but I would venture to guess that it was most likely her husband, Isaac. Why? Because Isaac was a praying man. He was praying for her before. So church, don't miss this. When they were waiting, Isaac was praying. Now they are worrying, Isaac is still praying. Here we see what a man of prayer Isaac was. So waiting or worrying, Isaac, prayer was his go-to. Now my question to all of us is, what is your go-to? When you're waiting and when you're worrying, what is your go-to? Or maybe who is your go-to? Is prayer to the Lord our go-to today? May the word of the Lord challenge us to begin to do so. Okay, we also see what years of prayer has done for Isaac. Remember he prayed for a long time? Prayer has drawn Isaac closer to God. What do I mean by that? You see, before this episode, the Bible has no record of Isaac ever hearing from God. His parents, Abraham and Sarah, oh yeah, plenty. They, they've heard from the Lord many, many times. But Isaac, no, not even once. But here we see that the Lord speaks through Isaac to Rebecca. All those years of prayer has drawn Isaac closer to the Lord. Now your prayer is not just you bringing your request to the Lord, it's you bringing the Lord closer to you. When you pray and when you build up a life of prayer, you build up a life of intimacy with the Lord. Verse 23, the Lord said to Rebecca, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So a whole bunch of stuff in here. So let me explain what this means, okay, bit by bit. The two nations in her womb are the nations of Israel, which are the descendants of Jacob, and the nation of Edom, which is the descendant of Esau. Two nations. The two peoples who will be separated are not just her twins, Jacob and Esau. Yes, they will be separated at birth. That's what happens. But it is two groups of people. That's why the Bible says two peoples and not two people will be separated. And one particular group of people, the Israelites, will be stronger than the Edomites. And that's why God says Esau will end up serving his younger brother, Jacob. So what God is saying here is actually a prophecy and a promise of the many victories that the nation of Israel is going to have over the nation of Edom. For example, a thousand years later, we read, we read this record in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 15 to 16. He, that is King David, put garrisons, he built forts and barracks throughout Edom. And all the Edomites became subject to David. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. This is what happened in the future. It's a fulfillment of the prophecy, a fulfillment of the promise of God. Now coming back to Rebecca's story. Here, we get a glimpse of the relationship of how we see things. This is how God sees things. What do I mean by that? You see, Rebecca could only see the immediate. God, what is happening to me right now? But God could see the imminent. He could see the future. 
He knows the end from the beginning. Rebecca was fixated on her problem. Lord, I'm going to die. But God was focused on his purpose for what he's going to do in the nation of Israel. Rebecca was worrying about saving herself. I need, I'm going to die, Lord. But God was working on saving the world. God sees the much bigger picture than what we often see. That's what it means. So brothers and sisters, here is the lesson for us. God is working his plan out and his plan will work out. Someone say amen. God hasn't lost a plot. He knows exactly what he's doing and we can trust him with our worries. Hallelujah. So number one, the struggle of waiting. Number two, the struggle of worrying. Number three, the struggle of resting. Resting. Now, I'm, this is not a typo. <laughs> it's not the struggle of wrestling. No. It, neither is it the struggle of resting. Okay? It's none of those things. What is resting in here? Resting means to violently, forcibly pull something out of someone's hand. Have you ever seen two children fighting over toys? <laughs> Someone would just pick up and say, ah, this is mine, this is mine. And then the other one would go up to the other child. Sometimes they would smack them on the head, right? And then say, no, this is mine, 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 mine. They're trying to wrest the toy off each other. This is what it looks like. And this is what we see Jacob doing for the rest of today's passage. You will see what I mean in verse 24 to 26. When the time came for Rebekah to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first came out, the first to come out was red. What a way to describe the baby. And his whole body was like a hairy garment. Woo! All right. So they named him Esau. And after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, and he was named Jacob. Now, the main point of these verses, please note, are two things. Notice the order and the names of the two boys. That's the focus of these two verses. How do we know that? We know that because of the statements the Bible makes in contrast. He says, the first to come out. And then he says, the second to come out. It's the order. And then they said, so they named him Esau. And so he was named Jacob. It's the naming. The Bible is bringing us focus into the order and the names of the boys. And this is important because their names and their order determine and define their life stories. And you will read this all throughout the series, all right? So the firstborn was Esau, whose name Bible scholars literally think it means red. Red, all right? And the second was Jacob, whose name literally means the heel grabber, or idiomatically, or metaphorically in Hebrew, it means the deceiver, the con man the liar, the cheat, okay? I don't know about you, but if I would have many children, I would not name my children by the color of their skin. You shall be named blue. You know, babies sometimes, they are not nice and rosy and pink. They come out gray, all right? You shall be named gray. You shall be named baby pink. I can't decide what color are you. You shall be called rainbow. And there are people who are called Rainbow. And you will not name them. I will not name them by the very worst thing that they're going to do in life. <laughs> hey, hey, Mr. Late. Mr. Late. Hey, 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 Mr. Disobedient. Right? Disobedient Yen. You shall hereby be named Disobedient Yen. We do not name our children by the very worst that they are or by the color of their skin. But here's why it matters, because in Hebrew context, a person's name defines what kind of character he or she would eventually become. So the Bible is making it known to us. <laughs> Esau and Jacob's life is going to be really messy. And Jacob and Esau began their lives literally on the wrong foot. Read what it says in verse 27 and 28 now. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. That's their homes. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, he loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. 
Now, if the differences between the two boys before they were born was already pretty big, the differences are gonna get even bigger now. Notice, Esau is portrayed as a wild, unrefined brute. You know that character in Popeye the Sailor Man, Bluto, the guy with the muscles? He's like that. You know the character in, in X-Men, Wolverine, rah, the wild guy? He's like that. You know the character from Wreck-It Ralph? Ralph? He's like that. The Bible is portraying him as the big, unrefined brute. And in Israelite culture, hunting is actually not held in high esteem. Did you, did you know that? It is not a proud thing to say, I'm a hunter. You don't see many biblical hunters in the Old Testament. And the great irony is this. I find it's really funny. The irony is Esau, this skillful hunter, the Bible calls him skillful, will later return from the fields from his hunting with nothing. In other words, the man with the skills was the man with no kills. That's what it means, okay? So it's really funny. And, and Jacob, on the other hand, is portrayed as a domestic homebody. The Bible calls him content to stay at home among the tents, or literally, a peaceful man living in his tent. That's what it means, okay? One Bible scholar commented that the Hebrew word tam, which is peaceful, right, or, or content here, that is used to describe Jacob, literally translates to complete or perfect, which is truly, truly ironic because Jacob and his life choices were far from perfect, as you will read throughout the series. At this point, I just want to say I love the Bible. <laughs> It's so interesting. I love God's Word and how paradoxical, how amazing it is. There's always more than it meets the eye. All right. And like a good K-drama, the story is now all set up, okay? So the, the props are all set, the stage is set, the story is all set, you get the background, the plot. And now everything is all set up for now Jacob to wrest something really important from Esau. He's going to rest it off. Now, I'm going to talk through verse 29 to 34, line by line, and I'll make some quick comments, and I'll close it off, okay? So, verse 29. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, the word once implies that this was just one out of the many times that Jacob cooked stew. Master chef, anyone? All right, Esau cooks, sorry, Jacob cooks, and Esau came in from the open country famished. He was really hungry. And so he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I am famished. And that's why he's also called Edom, all right? Notice how abrupt and how unrefined Esau is. Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I am hungry. That's literally how it sounded like. And verse 31, Jacob replied, okay, okay, first, sell me your birthright. All right, wait, straight up, this is a terrible, terrible deal. It, it, deal. It's like you going up to a restaurant and say, auntie, I would like to order that soup. And then when the bill came, the auntie say, okay, here's what it's gonna cost you. It's gonna cost you your Tesla. <laughs> Give me your keys. Give me your keys. Uh, this, is, this is a straight up terrible deal. You see the disparity, the difference in the, in the price and the value. And then Esau says, look, I'm about to die. Esau said, what good is this birthright to me? Now Esau is exaggerating here, all right? He's not gonna die. But that's what brothers do. <laughs> if you had a brother or a sibling, right? They exaggerate, right? If you're not gonna give me my money, I'm going to die. If you're not gonna share your toys with me, I'm going to kill you, right? But siblings exaggerate, that's what brothers do. And by the way, no way a skillful hunter is going to die of hunger, all right? He would be able to kill something and eat it. Okay, but Jacob said, all right then, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Now swear to me first is like saying, okay, you want that stew? You wanna give me your birthright? Let's go to the lawyer's office and sign first. That's what it means, all right? So back then, swearing was the most formal and official way of agreeing on something. Finally, last verse. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. I love how the Bible said that Jacob, for his goodness and for his generosity, threw in some free bread. 
<laughs> to the stew. I know stew goes well with bread. Here's some bread for you. I'll give it to you because I'm generous. But that's like throwing in a free keychain when, when somebody bought a Tesla. All right, it's, it's nothing. Now notice how abrupt, once again, Esau was. He ate, he drank, he got up, he went. This was a man who simply didn't care about his birthright. Now if this story begins to sound strange and shocking to you, let me tell you, you are normal. <laughs> this story is very, very bizarre. But to begin to make sense of what this story is about, we need to understand what Esau's birthright entails. And the Bible gives us very quickly three possibilities of what this birthright means. You see, in Israel, the birthright of a firstborn, whether an animal or whether a human, meant three things, very quickly. Number one, it meant the firstborn belonged to God. That thing belonged to God. In Exodus 13 verse 12, the Bible says, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock, they belong to God. So they belong to God. Number two, it is they are bestowed their father's power, okay? Genesis 49 verse three says this. Jacob himself said this later on to his firstborn. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. They are given the father's power. And number three, they are blessed with a double share of their father's inheritance. All right, Deuteronomy 21 verse 17, the Bible says, the father must acknowledge that the son of his unloved wife, now the context is, this guy has had many wives, the firstborn, his first son came through his wife that he doesn't really love, now he still owes the firstborn a double share of inheritance, this is what he's saying. So he must, by giving him a double share of all he has, that son is the first sign of his father's strength, the right of the firstborn begin, belongs to him. So it belongs to God, he's bestowed the Father's power, and he is given a double share of the inheritance. Now, we begin to understand why this is so important to Jacob. Remember, Jacob was a man who wanted to be in control of his own life. He wanted to have a good life. So it was a big deal for him to get that thing of Esau. And it was enough for him to dishonestly wrest it from Esau. Let me close by talking about Esau and then Jacob. This man, Esau, he gladly exchanged his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup in a flash like it was nothing. And I think this is a powerful image of how we tend to exchange God's very best, God's promises, God's blessings for something immediate just because we feel that we need it now, just because we do not trust that God will come through for us. Maybe we're waiting. Maybe we're worrying about something. Maybe some, we feel like the Lord is not gonna come through for us, so we are gonna begin to take matters into our own hands. That's what we see Esau doing. Do you know what the Bible calls this tendency to do that? Hebrews 12, verse 16, it says this. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the older son. The Bible says, godless, without God. Wow, I think that is a really, really strong word. But I think that's precisely it. That's how seriously God sees it. Whenever we choose to exchange God's best for something less. And let me finish off the story with Jacob, our main character. Church, I want you to see the great irony of our human sinfulness within his story. You see, earlier on, a few verses before this story, God had already spoken to Isaac and Rebekah. And he promised blessings. He promised his favor. He promised so many good things, not to the older son, but to the younger son. God says the younger son, the older son will serve the younger son. He will be a great nation. God was going to bless the younger son over the older son. But ironically, what we see is Jacob now wanting to be the older son when he is the younger son. Can you see what's happening here? And I think 
there are some reasons why he might do so. I think number one, maybe is because he doesn't really trust what God is doing in his life. Maybe he doesn't believe that God is gonna come through. Maybe he missed out completely that God is at work even behind the scenes. This reminds me of one of my favorite movies of all times. It's called The Greatest Showman. Maybe some of us have watched it. In this movie, the brilliant Hugh Jackman played the part of P.T. Barnum. Now at one level, Barnum is a man who is wickedly smart and outright ambitious. But at a far deeper level, he's also a man with an insatiable need for love and acceptance. And as the story goes, Barnum began very poor, but he eventually became super successful. But at the very peak of his career, he also hit the lowest point of his life because he had gained all the applause, all the accolades, all the achievements that he ever dreamed of, but it almost cost him his family. In the end, Barnum comes to his senses and realizes that the very things that he's been craving for all his life, unconditional love and acceptance, has always been there with him. Not in the form of fame and fortune, but in the form of his family. He missed it completely. And so too goes the story of Jacob. He was wickedly smart, very smart. But he either didn't know that God was going to bless him, or he didn't believe it. And so he tried to wrest from his brother the very things that God had already promised to him. Now before you, are, you and I are tempted to think that that is so stupid, think again. Because do you realize that sometimes we behave just like Jacob? We do that whenever we choose to lie and try to control the outcome. When God clears, clearly tells us to speak the truth. We do that whenever we're dishonest with money to try to control how much money we can save and how much money we can make. When God clearly tells us that he will supply all our needs according to the glorious riches in Christ Jesus. We do that whenever we watch pornography or whenever we have sex outside of marriage because we don't believe that God has his best waiting for us in the days to come. So we take matters into our own hands and for our own pleasure. We do that whenever we are more focused on living a good life than we are living a surrendered life. When God says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given you as well. Whenever we do so, we are wresting control from, of our lives from a loving God who already promised us in his word that he will work all things out for our good. As we draw to a close, church, in the Bible, God gives us this incredible promise to those of us who put our faith in Christ. Galatians 3.26 says this, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. And yet, brothers and sisters, sometimes we struggle with trusting God. Sometimes we struggle like we have forgotten that we are children of God. You see, as children of God, we don't have to struggle with waiting. Because what God says, He will do. As children of God, we don't have to struggle with worrying because God will work His plans out. As children of God, we don't have to struggle with resting control of our lives because God has already given us His best. On the cross of Calvary, God gave us His only Son. He had one Son. Only one had the divine birthright. Only one is the firstborn unto God, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ alone had the divine birthright. Colossians 1.15 tells us this, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He belonged to God. He was bestowed the Father's power. He had the inheritance of our Heavenly Father. Yet out of his great love for us, Jesus gave up his birthright to die on the cross for our sins so that by believing in him, you and I can now gain his birthright and stand before God as his children. 
John 1.12 says this, Yet to all who receive him, that is Jesus, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Church, we have become the children of God. What that means is our chains have been broken. Our past is forgiven. Our future is secure. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And all God's children who believe it, we say amen. Not because of anything we have done, but because of everything that Christ has done on the cross. So now in Christ Jesus, we are all children of God through faith. So brothers and sisters, may God's word encourage us and strengthen us today. We can trust him. We can count on him. He will keep his promises. And can we, if you believe it, can we all give Jesus a good amen? Amen. How many of us are grateful for the cross? How many of us are thankful for what Jesus has done? Come on, let's give him a big hand. Church, would you stand with me right now? I'm going to pray and we're going to go into a closing song just for us to respond. But as I was in the backstage, I was asking God, God, how do you want me to end this? Lord, what do you want your children to respond to you with today? How do you want us to respond, God? And I sense the Lord saying that there are some of us here today, we need to relinquish control to the Lord. We have been trying to control our lives. We've been trying to hold on. That makes us anxious. That makes us fearful. That makes us worried. That makes us really, really stuck where we are. And the word of the Lord today is challenging us as His children. Come before the Lord today and just trust Him. Just trust me. I am in control. Would you relinquish your control over your lives? Would you stop resting control and trying to gain what I have already promised you as my child? And if the Lord is speaking to you today, would you come to the front as I'm praying, as we're worshiping? If, or if you don't know Jesus and you wanna give your life to Jesus and have Him to bring you into the family of God as His child and to give you new life, that forgiveness of sins that He has promised, if that's you, you come to the front as well. Let me pray, and then we'll all come to the front and we'll all worship. Lord, Jesus, we thank you that you are so good. You didn't have to come to give up everything that you are for us. Yet when you looked upon us, you didn't see us just as sinners. Yes, you did, but you also saw us as children of God. For those of us who have come to receive you, who believe in you, and believe in your name. We get to be called the children of God. Wow! Lord, we come to you as we are, believing that you are more than enough. That you, when you work out your plans, your plan will work out. And we trust you this morning. We're sorry for trying to take control of our lives, but today we want to surrender to you. So we come before you. And in Jesus' mighty name, all God's people say, Amen.